Everything has history. Countries, professions, your mother and I. Today we're going to look at the history of wigs and how syphilis changed it. Wigs have been around for thousands of years. In ancient Egypt, both men and women wore them. They were mostly used for practical reasons, like uh, protection from lice and thereby disease, and to protect themselves from the heat of the sun. Wigs did become a symbol of social status, where the most intricate and decorative wigs pointed towards the highest rank. The wigs of the time were made by human hair, wool, and fiber from plants and vegetables. There's plenty of other civilizations from the ancient world that used wigs. These civilizations include the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Jewish people of Israel, the Phoenicians, the seafaring salesmen that sold purple, which we talked about in the last video. Ancient Rome also adopted the practice of wearing wigs. They got the hair from slaves, war, and trading with India. Because of their struggle with the Germanic barbarians to the north, they viewed blonde hair as something inferior, and the prostitutes of Rome were required by law to wear blonde hair. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century, Europe and its use of wigs fell into the Dark Ages. They would not return until the 16th century, when an epidemic hit Europe. This is the point in time when syphilis makes its mark on history. It's unclear how the STD came to Europe, but it's speculated that Christopher Columbus brought it back from the Americas, which would be a great example of poetic justice, considering that European diseases like smallpox killed 90% of the Native American population. Anyways, the common man and royal families both fall victims to syphilis, and within 10 years the disease has spread all across Europe and into Asia, reaching as far as Japan. It became the worst epidemic to hit Europe since the Black Death. So what's the link between syphilis and wigs? To answer that, we must look at the symptoms. Open sores, rashes, brain damage, arthritis, deafness, blindness, dementia, paralysis, death, and perhaps worst of all, loss of hair. The infected wanted to hide their baldness and sores, so they turned to wig making. This time around, it was made by horse hair, goat hair, and human hair. The perukes, as they were called, were covered with powder and scented with lavender and orange. When Louis XIV of France started balding at the age of 17, he hired 48 wig makers to save his reputation. Long hair was fashionable for men in those days, and the aristocracy of Versailles cared more for superficial beauty than for the needs of its people. This would eventually backlash on them when the social movement known as Peasant Lives Matters went viral. Not long after Louis XIV became King of France, did his cousin, the exiled King of England, Charles II, return to his throne. Inspired by Louis, the new King of England wore wigs to hide his graying hair. It's highly likely that both of these kings had syphilis. The aristocrats of England and France jumped on this trend, and soon the upper middle class joined the bandwagon. Europe was wearing wigs again. The periwigs became a new way to flex your wealth, as only the richest could afford the biggest wigs. This is their origins of the word bigwig, meaning a person of importance. Another word that came out of this period is nitpicking, which figuratively means to point out small flaws or errors. Literally, it means to remove lice and lice eggs from hair, which became a lot easier now that you could just send it in to a wig maker, who would then boil it to remove the lice infestation. Wig making became a very respectable profession and an elaborate art form in and of itself. Wig maker skills were established across the continent. Several professions adopted wigs in their official costumes. Bishops, lawyers, and judges are in this group. In England and Hong Kong, and perhaps some African nations, they still use these traditional wigs in court. The peak of wig fashion can be contributed to Marie Antoinette, the Austrian-born Archduchess who became the Queen of France. 
Although infamous for her reckless spending and debauchery, she's also known for her magnificent and downright ridiculous hairdos. She popularized the poof, in which the height of the hair was between 30 and 90 centimeters. The wigs were often decorated with ribbons, flowers, jewels, and contemporary figurines. My personal favorite is the wig she wore after a successful French naval battle, where a smaller model of the ship is modeled into her hair. Then came the days of the French Revolution, also known as Peasant Lives Matter. The royal family was swiftly executed, and Marie Antoinette no longer wore any wigs after she was beheaded. Almost no one did. The common folk hated the overindulgence of the overclass, wigs included. Natural hair regained its popularity. Before we conclude the history of wigs with the modern age, let's look back at some of the historical figures that have worn wigs. Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Queen Elizabeth I, several of the founding fathers, and Teacher Tornal. In the last hundred years, wigs have made a small comeback. The fashion industry was growing, and models started to wear wigs on fashion shows. In the 60s, the invention of mode acrylic wigs made it much more easier to produce and buy cheap wigs. In today's society, we use wigs for theater and film, for convenience, for parties and Halloween. We use them to disguise ourselves, to deal with hair loss, for example after chemotherapy. And we also use it to look absolutely fabulous. Several celebrities like Lady Gaga and Sia have made their image based around wigs. Thank you for watching this video. If you don't have syphilis, give this video a like. You can also check out my last video about the weird history of purple if you're interested in that. If you know any cool history facts, let me know down in the comments. I will see you all next week, so be sure to subscribe. Goodbye.